Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to another outstanding City Club program and to the first forum at our new home base, the Multnomah Athletic Club. Today we focus on the state of the state with Governor John Kitzhaber. My name is Pete Heuser and as your president-elect, I'll preside today in Fran Storr's absence. Before we get started, I have a few announcements. We have a new member in the audience, Judith Aftergut, who is facilitator at Learning Search Design. Uh, please stand, Judy, wherever you are. There she is. Welcome to the club. On Friday, January 23rd, join us again at the MAC for our economic forecast program. The panel will be composed of state economist Paul Warner, U.S. Bank Chief Economist John Mitchell, and Investment Counselor Lauren Weiss. The program will be moderated by consulting economist and member of our Board of Governors, Dan Goldie. The meeting will be here in the ballroom of the MAC Club. On January 30, join us for the State of the City address with Mayor Vera Katz. Please note that TriMet has generously provided two free passes in envelopes next to each place setting. So if you came by Max today, you can have a free trip back to the office. Thank you to Tom Walsh and TriMet. Today we begin a special membership drive for new members who join prior to September 28th, the $25 setup fee is being waived. If you've been thinking about joining the club, now is the time. We would love to have you. Our board host today is Don Williams. Don is business manager with the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt, and a member of the Board of Governors. Don will ask the first question of the governor. Following Don's questions, we will open the, quest the program to questions from other City Club members in the audience. As always, please identify yourself as a member and limit your question to 30 seconds. Don gave me his watch with the second hand on it, so I will be enforcing that, so please abide by it. Again, we look for questions and not speeches. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of the generous corporate underwriting from Portland General Electric, Wells Fargo Bank, and Providence Health Systems. We're grateful for their support. Now on to our program. City Club is honored to host Governor John Kitzhaber's State of the State Address. We in Oregon are fortunate to have a governor with the political courage to lead us where we should be going. He has advocated real change when change is needed and has encouraged us to stay the course when that is in the state's interest. Governor Kitzhaber has an opportunity to make a real difference in the next year. He has an administration in Washington, D.C., which he has proven he can work with and has challenges which need to be addressed. Only three months ago, Governor Kitzhaber announced to the City Club the formation of a state, federal, tribal forum to attempt to establish a unified policy regarding Columbia River salmon. His leadership of this forum will be necessary in order to reach a solution which will effectively balance economic interests with tribal, fishery, and environmental concerns. The governor has taken strong positions on the siting of prisons because he felt it was right for the state to have a facility in the Portland metropolitan area. His continued leadership on this highly emotional issue is needed as well. As a practicing physician, Dr. Kitzhaber knew more than any other politician about Oregon's health care system, and he used that knowledge to establish in his political clout to pass the Oregon Health Plan. But as the federal government uh, forces changes to our plan, the same expertise and political power will be needed in the future. For the first time, Oregon, like so many other states, is becoming dependent upon lottery dollars to fund education. Some have been critical of this funding source, but few have questioned the, the need to maintain adequate funding for schools. 
Jack Beerworth recently pointed a finger at all of us for not caring enough about our schools, but maybe we just need someone like Governor Kitzhaber to point us in the right direction. Perhaps the single most important issue facing the governor this year is the state's financial system. The economy has been booming like never before, but more than ever we hear about excessive and unfair taxation on the one hand, and underfunded state and municipal services on the other. This year the governor will be receiving recommendations from two task forces dealing with taxation. The challenge will be to resolve the differences among the strident factions in our state and to get the, us moving in a productive, if not necessarily unified course. In short, the governor has shown a willingness to take positions based upon the good of the state and not merely to promote his short-term popularity. A most interesting issue for this next year is whether the governor will put his popularity to the test and run for re-election. Perhaps we'll hear more of that in his remarks today. Let's have a warm welcome for Governor Kitzhaber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an excellent introduction. I don't think I have anything else to say. I am very pleased uh, to, to be able to be with you today to uh, discuss the state of the state. And uh, due to a uh, recent change in my life, uh, I've had a lot of time in the relative quiet moments in the middle of the night to uh, <laughs> contemplate this very topic. And uh, as a result of that change, better known as my son Logan, I've had more cause than ever to think not just about the state of the state, uh, but particularly about the future of the state. For as long as I can remember, I have had a deep personal commitment to the state of Oregon. Uh, for the last two decades, I have served this state in public office. But until, until I became a father, I'm not sure that I fully appreciated the staggering responsibilities that I actually have, uh, not just as governor and not just as a parent, but as a member of the Oregon community to contribute to and to help create the kind of state that I want my son to grow up in. It's a responsibility that I believe we all have, and I believe that we are also starting from a position of strength. One of the things that has always defined Oregon has been our ability to do great things, to lead the way, to find new approaches. And the reason is that Oregonians have historically viewed their problems as shared responsibilities and have worked together to find solutions. Somewhere within each of us, flickering maybe, but certainly not extinguished. There burns a spirit of community that has allowed us to achieve things that other people would have viewed as impossible. The landmark accomplishments of our recent history, the Oregon Beach Bill, the Oregon Bottle Bill, the Oregon Health Plan, and now the Oregon Salmon and Water Watershed Restoration Plan, all reflect the deepest values and the highest priorities, not of government, but of the people collectively the values and the priorities of the Oregon community. When I look around the state today at some of the things that we have accomplished together, I do see many signs of a bright future. Our economy is doing very well. It's strong. It's diverse. Incomes are rising. Unemployment is down. More Oregonians today have health care than at any other time of our, in our history. We have reduced the number of children without health insurance from 21% to under 8%. We've dramatically reduced the number of Oregonians on welfare, and we've launched an historic effort to restore our watersheds across the state based on the commitment of thousands of Oregonians who have volunteered to work in their streams and along their rivers. All of these accomplishments point to a future for Oregon's children that we can feel good about. None of them could have been accomplished by government alone. All of them required individual responsibility and community involvement as well. 
But as remarkable as they are, they are only part of the picture because there are still a number of serious challenges that lie ahead. The challenge of helping our students achieve the high academic standards that we have set for them. The challenge of reducing juvenile crime. The challenge of managing growth in a way that preserves our exceptional quality of life. And the challenge of continuing to restore our streams and watersheds throughout the state of Oregon, including the Willamette River. Well, I believe that we can, in fact, meet all of those challenges if, if we approach them in the way that we have tackled problems in the past. Because the fact is, we know what works. We know that Oregon has always worked best and has always accomplished the most when it has functioned not as a collection of separate people or groups or institutions or interests, but as one community, diverse but unified in pursuit of common goals. Yet today, like a cloud on the bright horizon of our future, there is a sense of community. The sense of community and shared responsibility seems to be giving way to a widening breach among individual citizens and between Oregonians and their government. A growing tendency to think not in terms of community, but in terms of us versus them. A growing unwillingness to see our problems as shared responsibilities. On a number of issues vital to our future, I believe that individuals in this state are becoming disengaged in the hope that their government can solve these problems without them. Juvenile crime offers us a very concrete example. It is clearly a state problem and a very serious state problem, but it is also a community problem because these crimes affect the lives of individual citizens, our neighbors, our families, and our friends. Three years ago, in an effort to address this problem, the voters of this state passed Ballot Measure 11. In response, we will spend more than $1 billion in the next 10 years to build 13,000 prison and jail beds, and we will spend hundreds of millions of dollars more to operate those. Yet despite this enormous expenditure in public funds, which has come primarily out of education, Oregon is not, in fact, a safer place to live. In Portland alone last year, there was a record number of gang-related homicides. Now, this irony was brought home to me a couple of weeks ago by a story concerning a juvenile homicide in Boston that made the national news. Now, why, you might ask, would a juvenile homicide in Boston make the national news? Because it was the first gun-related killing of a juvenile in that city for 29 months. 29 months. Almost two and a half years. By comparison, in the last two years alone, there have been six gun-related murders of juveniles in the state, in the city of Portland. While we've been building prisons, the Boston police have been teaming up with social service agencies and community groups, churches, neighborhoods, to target and directly intervene with at-risk kids and offer them an alternative to a life of crime. So while jails are certainly necessary, it is equally necessary to try to prevent crime before it happens, and that requires the kind of community involvement that we're seeing in the city of Boston. Now I share this with you because I think it highlights what we already know here in the state of Oregon, that real solutions require not only state leadership but also individual responsibility and community involvement as well. And we can't simply hand problems off to the state because that is another way of saying, this is no longer my responsibility. And the fact of the matter is that the challenges facing Oregon are our responsibilities, both individually and collectively. Oregonians should know perhaps better than anyone else that in less problems like crime and education, and growth in protecting our environment become not just state problems, but community problems. Unless individual Oregonians work together as a community, then we are simply not going to be able to achieve the kind of future that I think all of us want in this state. And I do believe that we share a common vision of the future, not something abstract or intangible, but something involving real conditions that affect the lives of real people, especially our children. Speaking for myself, not only as governor, 
but as an Oregonian and now as a father, I can describe for you the vision of the state that I want for my son and for every other child in the state of Oregon. I want our children to be able to spend their early years in an environment where they can be healthy and safe. An environment that fosters a sense of security and self-worth and that opens their minds to what's best in the world, the wonder and beauty of nature and books and laughter and family and friends and strong but simple values like compassion and responsibility. When they enter school, I want them to be ready to learn. I want them to go to schools where the teachers have time to deal with each student as an individual with particular needs. I want classrooms with good textbooks and up-to-date technology. I want courses in art and in music and vocational courses for those who are interested. I want my son and his fellow students to travel to and from school on roads that are safe because they're in good repair and not clogged by congestion. I want them to be able to visit parks and public libraries and to fish in unpolluted streams and to hike in mountains and forests that look pretty much the way they did when I was young. And when they enter school, when they enter high school, I want my son and his friends to be ready to achieve the high performance standards that we have set for them. And I want them to go to schools where they won't have to be checked for concealed weapons and where they won't be tempted to use drugs or join gangs in order to attain social acceptance. And when they graduate, I want them to have all the tools they need to be successful, whether they go into the job market or whether they go on to a post-secondary education. That's the kind of future that I want for my son and for every Oregon child. And I believe that it is a shared vision. I believe there isn't a person in Oregon that doesn't share that vision of the future. So how can we get there? Well, not by expecting someone else to do it for us, but only by rekindling that sense of community and individual responsibility that have illuminated our past and which alone can light our future. We know what we want in this state. We know what works. It's only a question of each of us as members of this diverse, caring, creative, energetic community called Oregon of doing our part. So let me turn to four of the major challenges that we face in making our vision a reality. Achieving high educational standards, managing growth, reducing juvenile crime, and preserving the quality of our environment. I want to describe what I will do to provide leadership in these areas, and I want to describe what I expect of you. First, our vision includes a future where all of Oregon's children have equal access to an education that will prepare them to succeed in the 21st century. The new higher educational standards put us on that path. But success will take more than high standards and adequate funding, although both are necessary. It will also require that we somehow reconnect our communities to their schools. That's something we lost when Ballot Measure 5 simply turned the funding of public education over to state government. Our challenge is to restore that involvement and to restore that ownership. And as, as a citizen, I intend to lead by example, regularly spending time reading to children in the classroom, mentoring, and serving as a classroom volunteer. And I've already started an extensive series of meetings throughout the state with parents, teachers, administrators, and community leaders to find ways to help people to get reconnected and reinvolved in their schools. And what I'm looking for is programs and strategies that have worked. I'm asking what the schools need tomorrow that they don't have today to help our children meet the high standards. And I intend to use that information to create a link between the next budget and student performance. And I challenge all of you to make a similar commitment to these youngest of Oregonians. Get into the schools, communicate directly with the teachers and with the administrators, and be actively involved in your child's education. Whether you have children in school or not, try to find ways to expose students to the workplace so that they can connect what they're learning with the real world outside the classroom. And I call on all Oregonians 
to reach out particularly to those children whose parents may be working two jobs just to keep food on the table, who don't have time to read to their children or to help them with their homework or to give them the proper guidance. Because educating our children is, in fact, a shared responsibility. Second, our vision of the future is one in which we have congestion-free roadways. It's a vision of open spaces. It's a vision of balanced quality communities. Success will depend on managing growth in a way that preserves our exceptional quality of life. And that will require both state leadership and community involvement. And let me give you an example. Corvallis, like the Tri-County area, is currently grappling with the problems created by success. A growing number of jobs and people to fill the jobs, but nowhere for those people to live. I recently met with some community leaders in Corvallis who told me that increasingly people are moving to nearby Lebanon and Albany where the affordable housing is. These towns are now filling up with people who work in Corvallis. And the result is a forced commute, increased traffic congestion, and pressure to spend millions of dollars on highway improvements. Millions of dollars, I might add, that we don't have. Now, I believe that this and similar problems across the state could be avoided if communities looked beyond their boundaries and thought about growth as a regional issue. I'm not talking about creating another level of government, but I am suggesting that we need to create some appropriate forum for regions to plan cooperatively for the growth that is happening to our state. And I am already working to do just that, to bring the different regions of the state together to solve the problems that growth is bringing to us. Now, in this region, you already have a forum to do this, the Metropolitan Service District, or Metro, which recognizes, I think, that you don't really have three separate counties up here as much as you do a common metropolitan region, and that you cannot plan for and manage growth without coordinated region-wide decisions. It is simply not possible to do. If you don't believe me, check out Los Angeles. Now, I realize that Metro has come under fire from some quarters. And I don't think anyone will argue that Metro or, or any governmental entity can't, can't improve its governmental functions. So I urge you to make Metro work better, yes, but do not throw out this landmark effort to plan for and shape your own future in the Tri-County area. <laughs> Let me add that I sympathize with the desire to preserve neighborhoods. And we must support neighborhood efforts to maintain and restore their own sense of community. But we must also understand that ultimately our community, community is much larger than our immediate neighborhood. And growth has got to be addressed as a neighborhood and a city and a county and a regional issue. This too is a shared responsibility. Third, our vision includes a future where Oregon citizens are safe in their homes, on the streets, and in our schools. State government can build and operate prisons, and we are doing so. But we won't be truly safe until Oregonians are willing to demand of their legislature an investment in prevention that is at least as serious as the investment we are making in punishment. Nor will our communities ever be truly safe unless those within the communities are willing to reach out and support families and especially children at risk, unless they participate not only in their neighborhood watch, but also in their boys and girls club. Make no mistake, the social problems that our neglected and deprived kids bring to school have a direct impact on every other ch child and on our entire educational system and on our whole society. In the coming year, I will make the support of community-based juvenile crime prevention my top public safety priority. And I believe that if we could spend just a fraction of what we are spending on punishment, on kids who need the help the most, that we could, in fact, begin to turn the tide on juvenile crime. And that we could stop these kids from hurting others, but just as importantly, we could keep them from ruining and wasting their own lives. We know who these high-risk kids are. 
and we all know what will happen to them and to us if they're ignored. I'm convinced that caring and intervention at the community level can do what no government program can ever hope to accomplish. This also is a shared responsibility that we must shoulder. Fourth, our vision includes a nat national uh, environment marked by clean waterways and healthy fish habitat. I will spend the next year working to make the Oregon Salmon and Watershed Restoration Plan a success. In the next year, I will also lead the effort to restore the health of the Willamette River by implementing the recommendations of the Willamette River Basin Task Force. Both of these efforts are based on a philosophy which I deeply embrace, that we can accomplish more for our environment and for our sense of community by helping people do the right thing than by simply punishing them for their past practices. That we will accomplish more for a watershed when a community has made it a priority than when a state has made it a mandate. Now, as people who are lucky enough to live in this beautiful state, you must also play your part by managing your life in a way that minimizes adverse impacts on the environment. If you live near a stream, allow plants to grow beside it. Reduce erosion. Reduce your use of fertilizer on your lawn and lawn pesticides. Watch what you put down the sink and into the storm drain. Believe that it makes a difference if you turn the water off while you're brushing your teeth. <laughs> Become a participant in your local watershed council or soil and water conservation district. Work with the appropriate state agency to develop and implement a management plan for your farm or for your basin. Recycle. Conserve water. Conserve energy. Reduce waste. Protecting and preserving our environment is a shared responsibility. And I believe that if each of us does our part, no one's burden is going to be too great to bear, and the rewards will belong to all of us. Now, clearly, I am asking much of Oregonians today, but much is needed. The easy path is to look at our present prosperity and reckon that the future doesn't need tending. But that is not the case. Just as you cannot bring into the world a healthy, normal child and just assume that his or her future is assured with no more effort or responsibility on your part. The same is true for the state of Oregon. Our great inheritance, a beautiful state, a distinguished history of civic involvement and civic accomplishment, was made possible by men and women who did not take their future for granted. It was made possible by people who never questioned the principle that individuals with ideas can make a difference. It was made possible by Oregonians who had the determination to put those ideas into practice. And it was made possible by people who loved Oregon enough to get involved, to take responsibility for meeting the challenges before our state, and in so doing met them. Well, I refuse to believe that those people no longer exist in this state of ours. I refuse to believe that Oregonians today are unwilling to help their children learn, are unwilling to keep children from turning to lives of crime, are unwilling to help our communities grow well, are unwilling to keep our streams and rivers clean. Instead, I believe that we are as capable today as we have ever been of solving our problems and meeting our challenges. I believe that the spirit of community that made Oregon great burns as brightly today as it has ever burned, and that if we work together, no dream will lie beyond our grasp. American novelist James Agee once wrote that, in every child who is born, no matter in what circumstances and no matter of what parents, the potential of the human race is born again. Let each of us do our part to ensure that the state of Oregon and the community of Oregon, for us and for our children, remains the best place in the world to live. Thank you.
sure many of us naively voted for the Oregon Lottery Initiative in 1984, and in the last 14 years have seen an incredible expansion of the scope of this movement. In a letter to City Club earlier this year, you stated, number one, you voted against the Lottery Initiative, and number two, that you feel that gaming is changing the nature of our state. And I'd like you to address what we as concerned citizens, who many of us feel powerless to stop the momentum of this um, industry can do and what your position is. Actually, I won a jackpot last week, but they told me the chip was faulty. <laughs> Um, gaming in Oregon um, is not going to go away. Um, people in Oregon like to gamble. I think the question is how do you put it in its proper context? And the mission of the Oregon State Lottery was to maximize revenue commensurate with the public good. And I think the commission has been focusing primarily on maximizing revenue and have been doing a crack up job at that. Somehow we have to balance that with the public good. And I think what's been lacking from the public policymakers is a definition of what that public good is. So I've tried to do two things. Let me put the tribal gaming aside for a second because that's a bit different. In terms of the state lottery, uh, ensure that um, we don't increase the addiction, if you will, of any of three groups with our individual decisions. One, the addiction of uh, individuals who have uh, gambling addiction problems. Secondly, the dependence or addiction of the state uh, on operating revenue. And third, the addiction of a small group of retailers who are becoming dependent upon proceeds from video poker. Uh, that's the litmus test I put to the, uh, to the, uh, the Lottery Commission. In the next budget, we need to, in my view, uh, segregate a piece of the general fund for gambling addiction that's related, the magnitude of which is related to the amount of revenue that's coming in. And we need to begin to back lottery proceeds out of operating budgets, which is probably going to be a two or three biennium uh, uh, project, uh, and use them for one-time capital investments that, uh, that wouldn't be hurt if there was a downturn. On the tribal side, the tribes are sovereign governmental entities and need, need to be dealt with on a government-to-government uh, government basis. It's a negotiation process. What we're attempting to do there is, through negotiation, get agreement for one casino per tribe, uh, get a, a larger involvement of Oregon State Police in the security operation, and try to get a donation to a community uh, a fund. Uh, uh, and I guess the model would be the, uh, the uh, compact we signed, signed, uh, signed with the Grand Ronde. David Wu, City Club member. Governor, a couple of years ago, you appeared before a joint meeting of the City Club and the Rotary Club of Portland, and a concerned parent rose and asked you then what you intended to do in the state legislature uh, for the troubled fiscal situation in the Portland public schools. And to briefly paraphrase you, I believe you said at that time, uh, nothing, the time is not right yet. Now I'm asking you, as both governor and parent, are you ready to step up and do something both in Salem and in Portland to help with the fiscal situation for the schools in our community? You know, I anticipated this question. <laughs> um, I, first of all, let me say that I am very cognizant of what's going on in the Portland School District right now, the, the mid-year the mid layoffs, and uh, it is of great concern to me because the, the people who, uh, who suffer from this are the kids in the district. I do have to tell you, however, that I think school funding uh, is a partnership, uh, and I do believe that the state of Oregon in this last millennium did uphold its part of the partnership. The entire budget debate in Salem was driven around a number. 4.35 billion that came out of this district, uh, and the entire budget debate was contrived to get 4.35 billion, which was the number we were told would protect this district uh, from layoffs. Now, we produced that number. You're having some layoffs. So in fairness, I think the Portland School District has to get its own financial house in order. You can't budget to a moving target. Um, now, that's not a hostile answer, I think, but I do think that, in, in fairness, we have to know what the real number is, and, you, and there's a credibility issue involved here. The best way, the best way you can help me help you get an adequate budget for schools is we've got to be able to explain to the legislature and to parents and to the general public what those dollars are buying. And that's really what I'm doing right now, trying to get the information necessary so we have better tools to defend the K-12 budget. 
No longer can it be a debate about 4.2 billion or 4.35 billion. We need to be able to say another 50 or 100 million dollars into this district is going to produce these results in terms of improved outcomes and improved measures. I think Diane Snowden's doing a great job kind of getting at that. You need to support her and help her in that, and I look forward to working with you. Jay Formick, City Club member. Um, in your address, Governor Kitzhoffer, you invoked the memory of Measure 5 and implied the memory of Measure 11 uh, in speaking to the necessity for building more prisons. Um, both of those were the consequences of citizen petition uh, initiatives. Uh, you asked Oregonians to make a couple of contributions in a non-material kind of way. I'm wondering if you would be willing to ask Oregonians to limit the uh, citizen petition initiative process or put thresholds or controls on it uh, as per some of the uh, suggestions made in the City Club report on that issue? Well, I believe in the initiative process, I also believe that it is currently being misused uh, and did support a, pa a package of recommendations that uh, was being advanced by the Secretary of State that didn't, uh, I, don't, I suppose it got a hearing, but didn't get out of the legislature. I do think there are some things we can do in terms of how you pay uh, signature collectors uh, by the hour rather than by the signature. I think you could modify the number of signatures required to put something in the Constitution uh, rather than uh, in statute. Uh, and I would support those efforts. Uh, the ultimate check on the initiative process, however, rests with everybody right here in this room. You don't have to sign them and you don't have to vote for them. Uh, and I think you need to be much more discerning uh, when you uh, uh, sign a petition. I was watching a, a story I think it was Channel 8, uh, some individuals paid petitioners raising uh, signatures for the Metro, the repeal of Met Metro. And the level of sophistication was, do you, like, do, you, do you dislike government? Great, sign here. <laughs> I mean, no discussion about the reduction in duplication of services or regional planning. Uh, so that's where we have, to, we, have to, we have to strike back. We should try to make some statutory, maybe even some constitutional changes, but we've got to be more discerning about what we vote on. Uh oh, Steve. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Novick, City Club member. First of all, Governor, I want to let you know that those of us concerned about tax reform are rather distressed that although you had three task forces on the Willamette River, you only have two on tax reform. <laughs> but that's not my question. <laughs> in, the la in the last legislative session, the Senate Republicans shot down a comprehensive transportation package, right? I prefer to call it a basket. I think that's a friendlier term. Um, but. And, Hopefully, in this next year, we'll see a few Democratic victories in the Senate and moderate that body, and hopefully we'll see you run again. Assuming both of those things happen, what sort of transportation proposal would you expect to put before the next legislature, and how would it tie into the vision of community you so eloquently espouse? Well, regardless of what happens uh, in the election, uh, the, the necessity for adequately funding a transportation system didn't go away just because the Senate chose not to adopt a package. In fact, that action will cost this state between 30 and 50 million dollars more in deferred maintenance that'll cost, that'll have to, roads that'll have to be rebuilt rather than simply repaired, which I don't think is very fiscally responsible. Uh, we have to add resources to our transportation uh, uh, trust fund in order to maintain our roads. And if I'm elected uh, and run, does it go that way? <laughs> um, One of, the, one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out how to get elected without running. <laughs> the, the, the imperial governance. Uh, in, in any event, uh, it is a very real, the preservation and maintenance piece is a very real, a very real issue, but I, I do need to add that, that we do have to have a congestion strategy that doesn't involve building more roads. And uh, if you'll bear with me, the example I gave about Lebanon and, and, uh, and Corvallis, uh, to improve Highway 34 will cost us in the neighborhood of $30 million. Uh, for $30 million, you could get four transit buses, pay for them, and operate them for about 450 years. Uh, it's it's $50,000 a year. So we need a, we need a funding package, but we also need a congestion strategy. Uh, Governor uh, Ray Polani, a member of the City Club. Uh, obviously, you are in favor of public transportation funding. Uh, why, instead of supporting a new mileage tax, 
which will require a constitutional amendment to be used for public transportation, why are you not actively supporting asking Oregon citizens, Oregon voters, for a constitutional amendment broadening the use of the gas, of the existing gas tax, to include public transportation? Well, I uh, uh, have been supportive of, of, of providing more flexibility in the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, it uh, is not anything that uh, has, has what, we, what should we say, developed political legs in the past. It, uh, it tends to be vigorously opposed by AAA and a number of other entities. So part of it's an educational process. Uh, I do think there are other ways that you can, uh, that you can develop uh, funds for transit. We had s several suggestions in the, in, the, uh, in the bill that passed the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, there was a flexible funding component for, for transit issues. Uh, so uh, whether, whether we liberalize the use of the Highway Trust Fund or find some other revenue source, uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, our transportation future and our quality of life future depends on having some source of flexible funds for uh, uh, moving people out of individual automobiles into transit and other mechanisms to, to uh, manage congestion. We hope you will involve Oregon voters in the, in the issue. I, I assure you they, will, they are always involved, <laughs> one way or another. Governor? Tuck Wilson, fellow pilot. <laughs> the growing instances of juvenile gun violence to which you referred has resulted in a recommendation by the Portland City Council, the Multnomah County District Attorney, the Mayor of Gresham, the editorial page of the Oregonian, that a governor's commission on gun violence be appointed. Will you consider the appointment of such a commission? I, the answer is yes. I've been uh, having conversations with the Attorney General, with Attorney General Myers, on that, on that very topic. And I think we all agree that uh, this is a, 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 a terrible problem that needs a very high level of attention. I can share with you uh, one of the strategies that was, was used in Boston. And, and forgive me, I'm not, I, I, I imagine this is also being considered here in Portland, but they call it street workers. Uh, and these are people who actually get out there and talk to the gangs, and, and you can identify who these, who these young people are. And the cost of that program was about $21,000 per year per, per uh, street uh, uh, worker. They hired 50 of them. And let me just give you the statistics. Uh, the number of youth 17 and under charged with violent crimes decreased 50% in the three years the street workers have been in place. Violent crime is down 20% in the public schools. And before two weeks ago, not one juvenile had been uh, killed by a gun in Boston in 29 months. So these strategies work. Uh, <clears throat> Governor uh, Gary Smanovich, Holistic Planning Resources. And this is, I've followed the citing decision of the prison in Wilsonville for some time. Uh, you know, it's very controversial. Uh, you know, the residents there don't like it. And citing prisons anywhere is, is very difficult. <clears throat> but I've kind of wondered if the state or, or yourself has, has given any thought to the idea that perhaps, um, you, know, that this, you know, this prison will, let's say, go forward, that you make it a model prison, that in a sense we don't look at these prisons as places of punishment and in a sense retribution, but perhaps healing centers uh, or a more holistic perspective, you know, a sense that perhaps you could make this a, a model prison where um, you know, kind of the state of the art ways of looking at it. Excuse me. Uh, have you have you thought about doing something like that with this prison? Uh, the short answer is no. I've been just trying to get it cited. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think your point is well taken. Uh, even under Measure 11, the vast majority of people in the criminal justice system are going to be out at some point, mm. uh, and we don't do a very good job. Uh, of, of transitioning them and rehabilitating them back in back into society, and uh, to the extent that we can make that a higher priority, which I think it should be. I mean, really, this is part of that larger issue. Um, if you talk to someone who's been victimized and ask them, uh, lo is locking uh, the perpetrator up for 50 years enough, or would you rather not have been victimized in the first place? Most of them will say they would rather have not been victimized. Mm -hmm. To do that, you've got to get in at the front end, and you also got to make sure that the prisons aren't just warehouses, but you can, you can prepare people right. for a transition back in right. Right. society. Thank you. Thanks. Governor Jerry Keene, City Club member. Um, during the last two legislative sessions, it, it seems to me that the dynamic's been characterized by a fairly low profile on your part, fairly high profile about aggressive remarks by the, the <coughs> legislative leadership. 
uh, marked by a number of bills being passed and then a record number of vetoes after each session. And when I've asked legislative leaders about that, they explain that, it, that it, a lot of it has to do with, with the frustrating inability to actually meaningfully get together with you and your staff before a session and get commitments on where you're going to be before they pass the bills and then lots of surprises afterwards. Is that a fair characterization or do you expect more of the same next session? Well, I don't think it's a fair characterization. <laughs> well, I, I, it's been my only chance so to the, ask so you. The answer, the answer is no and yes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me say that uh, um, I'm not going to say that uh, in every single case of the 100 bills I vetoed since I took office, uh, I was on top of them before they were passed. And uh, I can do better than that, and, and we'll work at it. But I will also say that it's a two-way street. Uh, this legislature passed a whole handful of bills after midnight uh, uh, with virtually no hearings the last day of session. I'm sorry, I didn't stay up to watch it. And all these things got dumped on my desk, and some of them violated the Constitution, some were bad public policy. Uh, and I vetoed him. I made no apology about that, but I'm willing to work with anybody to, to smooth that out. But if something bad comes across my desk, something I think is going to damage the future of the state of Oregon, I will veto it. Ted Kay, City Club member. Governor, in your opinion, what is the optimum tax structure for the state of Oregon? <laughs> I can handle that. <laughs> well, I think the optimum tax structure is one uh, that distributes the tax burden in a way that is uh, directly proportional to people's ability to pay. I believe that it is a tax system. I think I know you too. <laughs> I think it's a tax system that has uh, that is stable. A tax system that doesn't uh, fluctuate wildly basis based on changes in the economy that pro provides a stable source of revenue for certain institutions that have to keep operating whether the economy is up or down and the school system is probably the single most important. And finally, it's a tax system that reflects the social and economic objectives of the state. If in fact we're trying to uh, uh, encourage the expansion of small businesses or evaluated processing in the wood products industry, the tax system ought to encourage that rather than discourage it. And in terms of social policy, it ought to be a tax system that encourages, uh, uh, for example, moving people from dependence uh, to independence. And you can, you, can, you, can, you can design that tax system with a variety of combination of taxes. And quite frankly, I'll just say in closing that what we all get hung up on is the tax itself, the kind of tax, and the debate really ought to be on what you want the tax system to accomplish. Governor Scott Staff, City Club member, you spoke much about K through 12 education and even pre-K education. Now that the cat's out of the bag, you're on the hook for another <laughs> four years. What are your goals for higher education in the next four years? And if there are redundancies in higher education, how will you exercise leadership to eliminate them? Um, I'm actually very glad you brought this up because uh, the four issues I mentioned I think are, are central issues, but this, the state of our post-secondary system is, is extraordinarily important. Uh, it, I guess the, the first thing, and actually this is underway right now, we're trying to implement uh, the major recommendations of the Task Force on Higher Education and the Economy, which is an attempt to move the system to one that serves more directly the needs of the students and of the economic marketplace and is more about delivering uh, those services than managing institutions, uh, trying to allow the individual institutions some additional degree of autonomy so that they can be more nimble in a, in a world of the University of Phoenix's and new ways of delivering uh, uh, this product to, to, to students. Uh, and also trying to develop uh, much better transferability uh, between all of our post-secondary institutions. So students, for example, could uh, for exa get, get their first year of, of a four-year college education at Mount Hood Community College with transferability to the University of Oregon to deal in part with, it, with the uh, capacity issue. I will tell you that to make that work, uh, we need uh, additional resources into the system of higher education. We are extraordinarily low, uh, I think nationwide, in terms of our per capita commitment to post-secondary education at a time when everyone acknowledges the importance of a post-secondary education to be successful uh, in the marketplace. So I'll continue with the, to implement the recommendations of both the task force on higher in the economy and on, the, on college access, and we'll try to get additional resources in the 1999 budget. I'm Susan Hagmeyer, member of, the, of City Club and of the Portland School Board. And I want to clarify quickly that the number that came out of the Portland District for the first year of the biennium was $334 million. And the responsibility for figuring out how much it took statewide for the biennium 
could generate that for Portland resided with the Legislative Revenue Office. Um, and uh, we did not, in fact, get $334 million for the first year of the biennium in Portland. Um, my question is, do you have any plans to reform either the funding formula for public schools or the funding schedule for Portland for public schools? Because, um, because the schedule by which we find out how much um, we get for any, for any year uh, causes us to make mid-year corrections because we don't actually find out until uh, the year is already underway. Well, um, if you get two bites at the apple, so do I. The fact of the matter is, I was in Salem, and we could never get, out of your previous uh, superintendent of public, or your, uh, Mr. Beerworth, the right number. The number changed on a weekly basis. It's very difficult. $334 million from the first well, right Well, I sat right with you many times, ma'am, so uh, I'm not going to debate that with okay. you, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say that the Portland School District doesn't have some responsibility not to have a chief financial officer, for God's sakes. You do have a little bit of responsibility and accountability in this, and I expect you to deal with that, and I will do my part down at the legislature. Uh, in terms of trying to change the uh, uh, distribution formula, absolutely. We have a distribution formula right now uh, that gives to you uh, last year's enrollment plus inflation, uh, and then you get more based on certain types of students. For example, you get, I think, a weight and a half if you have English as a second language. Uh, it would take probably a weight of 10 to get me to learn a second language, and some other people can do it on much less. It's a very crude estimate. Furthermore, uh, the debate is based on seat time, which we're trying to change, but really the amount of money uh, that uh, you, know, you got last year plus these roll-up costs, and that creates the worst kind of cannibalism between school districts. So you've got to change the definition of adequacy to what it takes to get kids to the certificates of initial and advanced mastery, and we have to change the definition of equity from a per pupil expenditure to what it takes for any kid in any district to achieve those levels. That's going to take a significant change uh, in the distribution formula, and we do need a better way to have the school districts plugged in to the accounting process than we do right now. We have a, 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 a sort of a, a um, system in which the state pays the resources, but the individual districts have to negotiate the contracts and spend those resources, and that doesn't work and needs to be addressed. I'm Gus Matisdorf, a member of the City Club. Uh, I'll just say, say that I don't have any specific uh, commitment of yours or the political pronouncements in mind, uh, but you've spoken about the interrelationship between state policy and community policy. Uh, I wonder what you can teach us about the relationship between the state and the federal government. How is that working out in broad terms? Uh, what's working, what's not working, and so forth? Well, we have a couple of things I think that are working very well. One of them is the Oregon Option, which, we, uh, which I signed with uh, <coughs> Vice President Gore just after taking office. This was something that Governor Roberts was very instrumental uh, in developing and setting up, and she deserves the credit for it. Uh, essentially, it, it gives the state broad flexibility uh, in uh, delivering certain types of social programs as long as we meet uh, certain uh, out outcomes. So we assume accountability for delivering the product. They let us decide how to do it, which gets you out of a whole lot of bureaucratic red tape. And, uh, and uh, our welfare reform program is, a, I think, a good example of that. The Oregon Health Plan is another example of, of giving us the flexibility to, re to create a new way to deliver a service. The other one in the natural resource area uh, that's, that's going very well is the, uh, is the Salmon Watershed uh, Restoration Plan, where the federal government has been very supportive of, uh, we're really the first state in the nation that's been given the authority to develop a volunteer-based uh, bottom-up restoration plan. And it's really, as you can see, it's, uh, I know that the, the jury's still out on whether it works or not, but it has galvanized thousands and thousands of Oregonians and, and developed an atmosphere that's far different than the one you saw with the spotted owl. It's a much more collaborative one. Those areas are working, uh, working very well. Uh, we're a little frustrated on transportation uh, issues, uh, and of course we'd always like to get more money back from the federal government. Good afternoon, Governor. Randy, Randy Leonard, form, uh, fellow State of Oregon employee. Um, <laughs> I wonder, I think you've articulated uh, very well for all of us some of the problems we're facing with highways and with uh, primary, secondary education, higher ed, juvenile crime. Can you comment uh, how, you, uh, how you feel about the Republican leadership this last session holding tight in uh, sending back over $200 million to corporations in the form of a so-called kicker, half of whom don't even reside in this state, 
notwithstanding all of the uh, problems we, we're trying to deal with uh, in our state. Thanks. I think I get the flavor of your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, to, in all fairness, uh, the, uh, the kicker when we came into to, to the session, uh, when I put together the budget based on the revenue forecast, um, I believed we needed some of that kicker because uh, uh, we needed uh, to adequately fund our schools. We lost a significant amount of revenue from ballot measure 47. We had responsibilities from ballot measure 11 uh, to, uh, to carry out. So I had recommended a budget which did, in fact, have about an 18 percent uh, increase. Uh, about 15, 14 percent of that were doing things people ask us to do, implementing the tobacco tax and measure 11 and measure 47. The Republican leadership, to their credit, agreed that we needed an 18 percent increase, and they passed the budget. Uh, I know that they've been taking me to task lately, but the fact is they had six months in Salem uh, to cut that down to 15, 16, 12, or 10, but they didn't. The reason they didn't, it was a good budget for the state of Oregon. So I still think the kicker needs to be reevaluated, re but I think we produced a, a very credible budget uh, for, uh, uh, for the current biennium. Uh, Governor, you're our leading public philosopher, and I, I thought about you when I read an article by Robert Reich recently in which he said that uh, at one time at the national level, the Democrats were the party of justice and the Republicans were the party of noble aspiration, and that recently they seem to have switched places. I wonder how you would characterize the philosophical differences between uh, Democrats and Republicans in Oregon. I think I get the flavor of that one, too. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I really do believe that, uh, that in the state of Oregon, and I think this is one of the reasons that it is so enriching to be involved in, in public, uh, public life in Oregon is that this is a state that has traditionally been governed by, the, by a political center. It's been a state uh, that has addressed problems like transportation or education or good stewardship of the environment, not as Republicans or as Democrats, but as things that just have to be done to preserve the quality of life uh, that we have in this state. Uh, and the fact is, if you look at my party or you look at the Republican Party, I can name you people uh, in the Democratic Party who are easily as conservative in the traditional sense of the word, as people in the Republican Party, and vice versa. So I guess I am a person who uh, believes in partisan politics uh, uh, only up to a point. Uh, it's obviously, it, it allows you to, to, to have a, a lively debate during election, but I really believe that uh, the problems that face Oregon aren't partisan, shouldn't be viewed as partisan, should be viewed as uh, problems that we need to pull together and solve as, as individual Oregonians. Kurt Wabring, a member of the City Club. Uh, the State Forest Board has recently adopted some new regulations. Um, they sound good in, in some of the verbiage, uh, particularly at the broad level. Uh, how can we be sure that uh, the health of the forests are preserved and uh, that there, we just don't get into a cutting situation, particularly on the Tillamook? You're referring, he's referring to the uh, purpose of public lands rules, which was a, a rule adopted by the Oregon Board of Forestry to kind of provide guidelines for harvest of the Tillamook, which is now coming online. The rule, as it was proposed, gave a clear hierarchy to the harvest of the timber. Uh, it was a position that I opposed and appeared in front of the Board of Forestry. Uh, they have made substantial modifications in that rule. I know that it does not satisfy everyone, including some of my friends in the environmental community, but I do believe it represents a good balance. Uh, and I'm comfortable with it. Uh, I will watch it very closely. I also know that the timber industry is extraordinarily invested in our approach to implementing the Endangered Species Act and uh, is not interested in harvest practices that are going to jeopardize our no-list decision uh, on the coastal ESU. So I, I, I think this is one we should watch very closely, but I think the board did a credible job trying to balance uh, both sides of that issue, and I'm comfortable with the rule that they, that they produced. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. I know that we're out of time, but I, I would like to ask uh, you to think about how you will exercise your leadership in bringing about uh, conversations around race and uh, racial healing and reconciliation in our community of Oregon. That's a national discussion that is underway. I know that you are most aware of that discussion as well. It's not a subject that comes up much here, but what can we expect from you through your leadership? I'll mention two things very briefly because I appreciate we are out of time. We, uh, we already had a, a conference here in, in Portland on uh, overrepresentation of uh, youth of color in our, in our um, 
criminal justice system. If you want to reduce juvenile crime, you have to deal with that problem. Uh, and I thought it was very enlightening. We, we, uh, we uh, are going to be back in about a year, and we have an action plan to try to implement some of those recommendations. Uh, you and I have, have talked, uh, Senator, about uh, having some forums around the state uh, to, to discuss this issue. I remain very open to that, and, and we'll certainly work with you on that. Thank you. Thanks a lot.